In this episode, we're going to help you with one of the biggest areas in WVD, and that is planning your session hosts. And we're going to address several topics in the architecture design section of the AZ140 study guide. So stay tuned. I'm Dean Safola, and this is the Azure Academy. Host pools may be at the heart of WVD, like we talked about in our last episode, but it's the session hosts that do the work. Those virtual machines are what your users will connect to for their remote applications and desktops. And if things aren't configured right, you're gonna have issues. So we're gonna hit three major topics today. First, operating system requirements, virtual machine capacity and configurations, and then deployment considerations. So in operating systems, the main driver is the workload that you're going to be supporting. So what are the application requirements? Do you have to use Windows Server or can you use Windows Client operating systems? Once we have those requirements, we just need to pick the right OS from our supported list and we're good to go. Now this table does come right out of the WVD documentation and only Windows operating systems are supported today. Sorry, Linux. Now, if you're thinking about Windows Server, that's cool, but keep in mind you will additionally need RDS CALs with software assurance. As for the rest of the licensing issues, we'll cover that in a later episode, so be sure that your notification bell is clicked on so that you know when those come out. Also be aware that WVD does not support 32-bit operating systems, and Windows 7 also does not support VHD-based solutions for your profiles like FSLogix running on Azure storage due to sector size limitations. Now let's take a quick minute and talk about Windows 10 multi-session. The licensing for it only supports it running in Azure and as only part of a virtual desktop deployment. So that would be WVD's native solution like we're talking about here, or additionally in the appropriate Citrix or VMware Horizon deployments, but that's another video. And Windows 10 multi-session does exactly what the name suggests. It's a Windows client operating system, Windows 10, and it allows multiple users to be logged onto it at the same time. Previously, this was only available in a Windows terminal server instance, but now through the magic of software, you can use Windows 10 multi-session in WVD. That brings up a good question. How many users can I log on to a single Windows 10 multi-session host at the same time? Great question, I'm glad you asked. So there is no licensing restriction to how many users you can have, but there is kind of a technical one. And what I mean is that you are only limited by the number of resources available on that virtual machine. For example, you have one of the E-Series VMs and you had one of those sweet AMD Epic processors with 96 cores and 700 gigs of RAM, you'd be able to get probably over 200 users on that one VM. Now that may not be practical from a workload perspective for your system, but the point here is that you are only limited by the number of resources you have and the workloads that your users are doing. And just getting back to the licensing issue for one second, Windows 10 multi-session has to run in Azure and can only be activated from the Azure KM servers and no you can't get the license and install it on your own KMS it only works in Azure so with those restrictions how are you gonna ever build your Windows 10 golden multi-session image well that's a great question and we're gonna dig into that in a future episode so I don't want to take the time to do it here because there is a lot to cover on image creation and management now, as of today, you will need to still do a standard domain join of your VMs, or you could even do a hybrid join. And for those who don't know, that's doing a standard join and a join to Azure AD. And doing that will give you some other tools and options. So just know that that's a requirement and let's shift gears to talk about capacity planning. Now, this table is also in the Azure documentation and it's a general guide on sizing recommendations for different types of workloads. Like medium, heavy, and power. Now notice also the VM SKU that these are based on, the D4S V3. And that's a general purpose virtual machine that has four CPU cores, 16 gigs of RAM, can have dual gigabit network cards, and up to 8,000 IOPS of disk performance on eight disks. Now at this point, you should be asking, why did I just rattle off all of those specs for you? Well, it's because this is the key to VM capacity planning. And I'm not saying that you have to know the number of cores 
cores and the number of IOPS for a VM SKU size on the test, but I am saying that you need to be able to take the application requirements from your customers and then align them with the appropriate CPU, RAM, disk, network needs of that application to find the right VM size for your workload. You should also know the type of workload that it is. Is it more CPU intensive or memory dependent? Does it need a lot of disk capacity or disk performance? What about your network throughput? All these things will help lead you to the right VM size, and that's all covered in the sizing documentation for virtual machines, and I've got that link down below. And that's what this table is intended to help you with. However, at first glance, there is one thing in this table that's not so clear, and that's the definition of light, medium, heavy, and power. Now, I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? Well, thankfully, we don't have to guess here because the product team has given a link that goes to another Azure documentation page for remote desktop services, and that's where these are defined. And that'll lead you to a table that looks like this. Now, I'm not gonna waste your time by reading this table to you. You can do that yourself, and the link is in the description below. And just remember that these are general guidelines. These are recommendations. And it's far more detailed and involved than just how many CPU cores do I need to throw at this application. And some other things to keep in mind is the fact that WVD supports VMs of any size or type. That includes the general purpose D series that we mentioned a moment ago, as well as the GPU enabled N series, or even the burstable B series VMs. Every one of them can work in a virtual desktop. But one thing to remember is that it is recommended that you use a premium SSD on your virtual machines, and not all VM SKUs support premium SSDs. So having a premium SSD is important not only for your operating system performance, but your disk will have a lot to be doing with multiple users logged on and you also have FS Logix considerations. For example, if you're using Cloud Cache, you will need a more performant disk than if you're using VHD locations. And you know there's a lot to cover on FS Logix, so we will have several videos coming up. And be sure that you've hit the notification bell so you don't miss those. All right, two more things to cover and we're done. Planning your VM deployments. Now there are things that we'll dig into in a future episode here, but I just want to give you some things to think about around scale and high availability. Now I know it's a general Azure best practice that you put all of your virtual machines inside an availability set. And this is one of those things that helps you get to that service level agreement or SLA of 99.95, and that's great. And the purpose of those availability sets is so that you have VMs of a certain type of workload, think like web servers, and in case something goes wrong with the physical hardware in the data centers of Azure and one of those VMs goes down, I want my web server application to still be up. Now in WVD, we have different kinds of workloads. Take personal host pools, for example. Personal host pools means that you have one user on one virtual machine. And in this case, honestly, there's nothing to scale. I mean, think about it. If something goes wrong with Clark's VM, he can't log in. He's got to call for help. There's no other VM that he can log on to. That's the one he's been assigned. Now, you may be able to get him logged in onto a pooled system in the meantime, but that particular VM has to be fixed or restored from backup. So to be clear, I am not telling you to not use an availability set in your personal host pools. I think you should. If nothing else, you get that 99.95 SLA. But having an availability set is not going to make your personal host pool virtual machines highly available. It doesn't work that way. So comment down below and let me know that all of that makes sense to you. Because there's a whole other side of this coin and that is pooled virtual machines. There is no question that availability sets are good to use here, right? And let's think about it. From a high availability perspective, 100% yes. Pooled VMs are the same workload and you want to protect all of your VMs from going down if something happens in the rack or the data center. However, there is one little detail that you need to take a second and think about, and that is scale. Let's say that you have 1,000 VMs in your pool and you support 10,000 users. When you deploy your VMs into an availability set, there is a limit of 200 VMs in a single availability set. Now that's not a bad thing, it's just something to be aware of. So if you have a thousand VMs, that means you need, I'm gonna do the math and carry the one, and you need five availability sets. Now depending what you have in your deployments, this could take longer, 
and you may even have to repeat your deployment a few times due to how ARM templates work and the Azure API restrictions just to get everything built. And that's one part of it, but the bigger issue here is monthly servicing. How many VMs will you update every month or however often you plan on doing your updates? Are you gonna cycle through all 1,000 VMs in your pool or are you just gonna do a portion of them? If speed to deploy is more important than availability, then you have an option to not use an availability set. If you don't use availability sets, you can deploy 400 VMs at a time, which means that your deployments will be done twice as fast. Now, to be clear, I am not suggesting that you do this, but that it is an option. And as long as you clearly know what you're giving up by not using availability sets, then this might be a good idea for your environment. And by the way, if your environment is smaller than 1000 virtual machines in a host pool, then this isn't something that you'll really need to worry about at all and you should just be using availability sets. And the final word on VM sizing and operating systems and capacity planning and all of that is test everything. You should always be testing your stuff and not just that it works and IT can get in and administer it, but also that the users are happy. Well, I mean, at least as happy as users can be, you know, you know what I mean. And the other thing is, don't worry, this is the cloud, which means that if you happen to deploy a thousand virtual machines and you pick the wrong size and they're all too small, that's okay. You can resize them. Just make sure that you have enough CPU cores allocated in your Azure subscription quotas. And that's not only CPU cores in general, but also for that particular SKU that you want to use in that region. And if you don't, just put it in a support ticket and get the limit raised. Now, I know we went really fast and I hope you were taking notes because there is going to be a test at the end of this study guide. And we have covered a lot of information in our first four episodes and there is a whole lot more to come. So thanks for joining me today and check out the latest Azure Academy video up top, or you can continue on the AZ140 study guide with our playlist right over here. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you in the next episode. Happy learning.